Chang Li and the Silk Road Caravan, Chapter 14 There it is, called Hojanias just three days later, the valley of your missing princess. He sat on his horse at the crest of a ridge and pointed down through the dark green branches of the spruce trees. Chang Li rode up beside him. It's huge, he gasped. Far below stretched a wide valley green with the early burst of spring, and through the valley rushed a stream swollen by melting snow. All across the valley lay a confusion of brown tents, gray yurts, and colorful carpets laid out on the grass. Around the dwelling places, Cheng Li could see short, stocky horses, brown camels, black and white sheep, and men, women, and children, all dressed in a rainbow of colors. I never imagined so many people, Cheng Li said in awe. Hundreds, laughed Hojanias. Ten times that, maybe. Come on, yelled Tokta with his usual enthusiasm. Let's go. His horse plummeted down the mountainside, and Cheng Li followed as bravely as he could. Down the hill and across the valley they rode, into the jumbled collection of tents. He tried to copy the friendly gestures of the cousins as they waved and called greetings to the men and women they passed. Somewhere here we will find more cousins. We will stay in their tent, Hojanias called as he rode on ahead. Somewhere here, Tokta said with a sneer in his voice, we will find the tent of Haza, our gracious host. And when we do, little brother, your plan must be ready. Cheng Li rode behind Hojanias and Tokta as they threaded their way between animals, people, and tents. They found their aunt's tent, greeted her from horseback, and continued exploring. Children barely old enough to walk already rode well on horseback. Cheng Li watched the men bargain to trade fur from the mountains for pots and pans from the towns, warm fox fur boots for the spices to season their food. And the food! From all around came the nose-tingling smell of cook fires, baking the onion-covered flatbread, simmering pots of lamb stew, and roasting whole lambs. Cheng Li rode out to the edge of the crowded valley, turned and rode back along the bank of the stream. How would he recognize Haza? How could he find him in this crowd? He rode looking for some sign of the princess. He pushed through the crowd, greeting friends he remembered from his journey across the mountains, trying his best to look and act like all the other Kazakh boys. And always he looked ahead, watching, listening, hoping for a clue. Suddenly, off to the side, he saw it, a flash of brown among the brightly embroidered colors of Kazakh clothing. He edged his horse around to watch. Sure enough, there it was again, two children dressed in drab brown tunics struggling to carry heavy buckets of water from the swiftly flowing river. Child, Cheng Li called, using the gruff Kazakh words he had learned. I'm thirsty. Give some drink to a stranger. He rode slowly up to the girl and leaned down from his saddle to scoop up the water. He thanked her, but sat up disappointed. She was not mailing. The other girl glanced up at him, her tired eyes blinking wide in recognition. Here, she whispered, lifting up the pail. I can give you a drink. Cheng Li stared at the bent body and rough, chapped hands. The voice was Mei Ling's. He started to speak, but as he opened his mouth, he saw danger behind her. In the door of the tent stood a tall, bald-headed man in knee-high fur boots and rough woolen jacket. He didn't look dangerous, but Cheng Li knew immediately that that must be the dreaded Haza. Thinking quickly, Cheng Li spoke up. Thank you, girl, but that water must go to your master, he said, cocking his head toward the tent. In a whisper, he added, Do not show that you know me, but pay attention. I will come for you. For the next several days, families continued to arrive in the valley. Cheng Li spent the time visiting, making plans, and trying to act brave and eager for the race. How do I enter the race? he asked Tokta. Easy, said Tokta. Any young person of any age may enter, and they must gather tomorrow morning in front of that farthest yurt. Haza will be there. He will announce the directions, and when the horn sounds, you must ride like all the spirits of the demons in these mountains are chasing you. Clearly, whoever returns first wins. I'm watching the other riders to check on my competition, Cheng Li said. But I'm watching, he thought, and I'm making a plan. Whitebeard will be proud. At dinner that night, he sat with the cousins on the grass in front of the yurt. Hojanias, Cheng Li said, some riders had eagle feathers stuck in the top of their hats. Long ago I asked Aga about them. He said they were for luck. I need luck. He looked at Tokta. I will need a lot of luck. How can I get feathers for my hat? He pulled off his hat and punched at the top. Tokta's mouth dropped open. Luck? He gasped and threw up his hands in pretend horror. It's more than luck, little brother. You will never have eagle feathers. They announce to the world that the brave wearer has stolen his horse. At sunrise the next morning, Cheng Li awoke and pounced upon Hojanias and Tokta. Wake up! Today's the day! He opened the tent flap and looked out into the sunlight. The race! The contest! The win or be eaten alive day! I'm ready! Let's go! 
This race will be a test of everything I've taught you, little brother, said Hojinius as he joined Cheng Li. It is rough and brutal and long, very long, all day long. The main thing is, stay on your horse. I know, Cheng Li answered. It's more skill than speed, and you've taught me well. We'll go down the valley, over the mountain, along the ridge, into the next valley, and around the tents with the orange flags flying. Then home. He laughed a short, nervous laugh. They left the tent and made their way to the crowd gathering in the field. Women laid blankets on the ground to claim their space. Men worked with their sons and daughters to secure the horses. Across the valley, anyone who had no work to do reveled in the warmth of early spring. Men sat in circles, thumping frantically on their drums, while women and children stamped and whirled to the rhythm. Cheng Li saddled his horse and checked the lashings. Hojinia stood beside him and warned. Better tie everything twice. Things can get rough. I have no way to thank you for the weeks and months you've helped me, Cheng Li said, leaning down to speak quietly to Hojinius. If I'm successful today, I won't win the race at all, but I'll win my own prize. If my plan works, I can't come back to thank you. A and if I fail... Hojinius stopped him. Go, little brother. Race your best. We will cheer for you and remember you always. Go! Cheng Li turned and rode into the tangled mass of horses and riders. The race he knew had only one rule. Do not start until the horn sounded. A hundred horses bolted forward. Cheng Li hung on as his horse galloped, trapped in the crush of horse flesh and screaming children. Great spirit of my long dead horse riding, honorable father, he yelled into the chaos. Make me a son worthy of my father. Keep me on my horse. They hurtled forward across the valley. Cheng Li's thoughts dissolved into noise, pushing, shoving, pounding, past the tents, up into the mountain. Minutes came and went, hours came and went, trees, branches, rocks, and streams blurred and swayed and blurred again. Horses struggled, reared, bucked, and snorted. Cheng Li slipped sideways, grabbed the horse's mane, and heard Hojinius' words. Stay on your horse. A boy fell. No one stopped to see if he was hurt. The sun glared, dust blinded, sweat poured, hooves pounded. The riders thundered along the ridge and headed down into the last valley. Sweat rolled into Cheng Li's eyes. He reached down to rub his face on his sleeve and jabbed his wrist against his nose instead. It bled. He ignored it. Up ahead, above the bobbing, swaying mass of riders, he glimpsed the orange flags. Halfway. He'd made it halfway. His thoughts cleared. Behind him, he could hear the pounding of hooves and the yelling of riders. So he wasn't at the end of the pack. He'd managed to stay in the middle. Not bad. Not bad at all. Turn. Turn. Don't fall off. Ching Li yelled loudly at himself. He couldn't hear a word over the din. Hang on! He yelled again. With muscles sore and vision blurred, he realized he had reached the mountain leading back down to Haza's Valley. Now, he called out, the plan! Charging full speed down the steep slope, dodging trees and boulders, Cheng Li gradually forced his horse out to the edge of the pack. When the sea of riders flowed around a bend to the left, Cheng Li pulled with all his might and forced his horse to the right, crashing into the prickly branches of the trees and sending a shower of cones to the ground. He worked to calm the horse. He rubbed and talked and talked and rubbed and slowly brought the horse to a panting, trembling stop. Leaning down, he rested his exhausted head on the horse's neck. Thank you, spirit of my honorable father, he mumbled and grinned. I stayed on my horse. He raised his head and looked out between the trees. Good, he thought. No one noticed me leave. He worked his way along the mountainside, staying deep behind the curtain of trees. When he caught a glimpse of the tents and careening riders below, he got off the horse. No one must see him or hear him. He moved slowly until he saw that he was above the outer edge of Haza's camp, above the stream. He found a shelter for the horse between two boulders and tied the horse to the tree. Then slowly he moved down the mountain, staying in the shadow of the trees until he reached a spot directly above the stream. He sat down to wait. Sooner or later, he knew, Mei Ling must come there for water. The sun dropped behind the trees, shadows lengthened. Sweat dried on Cheng Li's back and made him shiver. He sat bunched up in a ball and tried not to shake. He had to be ready. Across the stream, carried upon the evening air, came the shouts of victory, the thumping of the drums, and the pounding and clapping of the dancers. Everyone celebrated the race, children, grown-ups, winners, survivors. He knew that anyone who remembered him would simply think he was somewhere in the crowd. He waited. The sound of splashing water caught his attention. There they were, the girls in brown. Please, oh please, take your time, he silently begged. The girls filled their buckets and turned away. Chang Li winced, no, no, no. He wet his lips and tried to whistle. No sound. He tried again. A soft whistle. A bird call. <whistles> Mei Ling stiffened. 
she lost her balance and the water bucket tumbled to the ground oh no G go ahead she called to her companion i've got to go back for more water ching li watched from behind the tree when mei ling reached the stream she turned slightly as she bent to fill the bucket are you there she whispered hurry ching li answered over here he reached out one hand to direct her mei ling put down her bucket and inched her way across the stream Without a word, she grabbed Chang Li's hand and ducked down behind the protecting tree. No, no, don't stop, he whispered. I've got a horse tied up above. They scrambled up the hillside, moving silently from tree to tree. A shadow loomed in front of them. Chang Li yanked at Mei Ling's arm and pulled her aside. Too late! A crack on the head sent him plunging to the ground. 